I sincerely believe that we are all products of our environment. We are shaped by our surroundings. This even makes me wonder how much grasp and control we truly have about our destiny. Because even statistics can and already has defined your chances of success by simply looking who is around you and in what circumstances you are living. Now, why am I speaking about this? Why am I talking about us being no more than products of our environment in a video talking about Digimon? The reason is quite simple. There are three Digimon who, based on their background stories, could have a similar narrative of being severely influenced by life around them. You see, there is a group out there called the Three Musketeers, a group of gunslinging Digimon based on outlaws of the American Old West that excel in their shooting ability and accuracy, hence do not miss their target prey. There is the Dragon Man Digimon Magna Kidmon, who is a digital incarnation of Billy the Kid, an American outlaw who will be explained shortly after. Interestingly, Magna Kidmon has been called the Dante of the Digimon Digital World, a reference to Capcom's Dante, son of Sparda. There is also Bill Starmon in the team of Gunslingers. Bill Starmon is a digital incarnation of Bell Star, another American outlaw who will be discussed in this same video. And just like Magna Kidmon, Bell Starmon is also seen as another character. It is mostly seen as the Bayonetta of the digital world, which is not really a surprise. Parts of the idea behind Bill Starmon is quite similar to Bayonetta. Last member is Gundramon, the machine Digimon with a massive quantity of firearms and with a height of probably over 260 feet or 80 meters, depending on the media depiction. There is a sense of irony that these three are called the Three Musketeers, and I will explain that in a moment. Let me first briefly tell you about the Three Musketeers and what they are all about for those who may not know much about them. In summary, the Three Musketeers is a historical romance relating to the adventures of four fictional swashbuckling heroes who lived under the French kings Louis XIII and Louis XIV, who reigned during the 17th century and early 18th century. You heard me? We are talking about four musketeers in a story with the title The Three Musketeers. It will make sense in a moment. At the beginning of the story, the main character, called D'Artagnan, arrives in Paris from Gascony and becomes embroiled in three duels with the three musketeers. The four become such close friends that when D'Artagnan serves an apprenticeship as a cadet, which he must do before he can become a musketeer, each of his friends takes turns sharing guard duty with him. In short, the story of the Three Musketeers is actually the story of D'Artagnan and his friends, the Three Musketeers. To also briefly tell you about the individual members of the Three Musketeers. Athos is a musketeer whose real name is Comte de la Fère, and despite his aristocratic origins, Athos obscures his identity and refuses to tell anyone about his past. Of the Three Musketeers, Athos is the darest, and there are often stretches of times where he drinks non-stop. And despite his occasional bouts of alcoholism, Athos is the wisest member of the group and is the most likely of the friends to act as a leader along with D'Artagnan. And during one of Athos' binge drinking sessions, he accidentally reveals to D'Artagnan that he used to be married to a woman who he killed. Evidently, Athos's attempt to murder his former wife failed because she is still alive and in the present, she's known as Milady the Winter. Although Athos usually keeps his emotions under control, he nurses a deep hatred for Milady and is the only one who seems genuinely happy after her death. Additionally, Athos is the best swordsman in the group and he has the best military mind. He's often the musketeer who is matched up with more than one enemy at once in combat and he always manages to come out unscathed. Porthos is a musketeer whose real name is Monsieur du Vallon. Of the musketeers, Porthos is the most concerned with his looks, he dresses fancifully and orders his servant to do the same. Porthos also acts as the novel's comic relief. He's always the last one to catch up on the plan and he often needs things overtly explained to him. And additionally, Porthos is the easiest musketeer to read. Unlike the other musketeers, Porthos doesn't have a dramatic arc that stretches across the novel. To finish, there is Aramis a musketeer whose real name is René d'Herblay. He is said to be an attractive man, although he largely avoids discussing women. Aramis is constantly torn between his life as a musketeer and his desire to join the church. 
and although the other members of the group are skeptical Aramis will ever leave the Musketeers, he proves them wrong by becoming an abbé at the end of the novel. However, for much of the story, Aramis is far from the perfect priest. Like the other Musketeers, he is interested in drinking, gambling and women. After studying the characters Athos, Porthos and Aramis, I quickly realized that there are more than one point in common with their Digimon counterparts, meaning Bill Starmon, Magna Kidmon and Gaundramon, and you will quickly understand why I said at the beginning that we are all products of our environment. But in order to better understand the parallels, I have to get a little deeper on these three Digimon. In Magna Kidmon's profile, it is said that it became a wanderer, traveling across the digital world in search of the comrades it was separated from. We can assume that they are talking about the group in general, meaning the three Digimon representatives of the three Musketeers. Now these three Digimon must have been separated from each other for quite some time, and sort of lived their own lives. Sometimes making friends and sometimes even making big enemies. And these stories actually make them resemble Athos, Porthos and Aramis so much more. You see, I said that Athos has an aristocratic origin. I said that he has a relation of hatred with Milady the Winter, and I said that he has the best military mind. Athos, in the digital world, would be Bill Starmon as their story is extremely similar. Bill Starmon also has a certain secret origin that it might want to hide from others. It's the fact that some of its data would link it back to the demon Beelzebub. And for those who do not know, Beelzebub's data has been digitalized on more than one occasion. More notably also on the Digimon Beelzemon, who is an evil king Digimon and one of the seven great demon lords, also seen as the chief nobility of the Dark Area, with each member having the right to command legions of nightmare soldiers if they so wish. Speaking of Beelzemon, Beel Stormon also has a rather odd relation with this character. It engaged in a disagreement with the solitary Beelzemon, but it has been confirmed that the two have been interacting with one another. If it would be hatred, they would have shot each other already. Could there be a possible love interest? Because if so, in this context, Bilsmon can even be associated to Madame de Winter. Bill Starmon might be hiding its true origin, but he did not hide its great combat skills. And remember, Athos, with his great military mind, was often matched up with more than one enemy at once in combat and he always managed to come out unscathed. And Bill Starmon is by some considered and even called the goddess that used to protect the city of Sandoria. The statue that is worshipped by many shows a Digimon resembling Bill Starmon, but in a more angelic appearance. It's a bit strange considering the demonic heritage. And you know what? I think this can't be a coincidence. And if we take the story of Athos into account, it might be safe to assume that Bill Starmon might have disguised itself into an angel because there are no records of Bill Starmon ever having been an angelic Digimon. It might have kept its identity hidden from all others who were in need of protection and help. With Portus, I said that it dresses fancifully and orders his servant to do the same. And I said that he was the easiest to read. Porthos is clearly Magna Kidmon. It also dressed fancifully, from the attire to the matching hat. It also has a servant, or in this case, more an ally that it considered one of its own, Deputy Mon. And Magna Kidmon is easy to read because everywhere it goes, it caused trouble and gets tangled up in scandals. To finish, there is the third musketeer, Aramis, who is constantly torn between his life as a musketeer and his desire to join the church. This is Gandramon without a single doubt, because while Gandramon is a confirmed member of the Digimon's three musketeers, it is also a confirmed member of the Crack Team, a cracker group from the real world that employs and abuses mechanical Digimon for unknown purposes, although to be straight with you, the Crack Team is a known group with evil intent. Aramis struggled between his life as a musketeer and his desire to join the church, because the church is a place that was more in sync with its nature. And Gandramon joined a group of like-minded and similarly built Digimon, they are all of the mechanic type. So there is a great parallel between the Three Musketeers and Digimon's Three Musketeers. The joke is that the Three Musketeers use swords, and Digimon's Musketeers use guns, rocket launchers and more. But with just this story alone, of how Magna Kidmon, Bill Starmon and Gandramon got separated, it is quite interesting because they lived their lives, 
and were shaped by their environment, or at the very least they were heavily influenced by their environment. But now the question is, what if they were to find each other finally? What is going to happen? Bill Starman has at least been associated with Bilsman, and Bilsman belongs to the seven great demon lords. It is at the side of darkness, no matter how you look at it. Now sure, Bill Starman took distance, but they are not enemies, or at least they are not confirmed enemies. Gundramon is part of the crack team, and they are also evil. Heck, they are known to have abused some Digimon. And Magna Kidmon is the only one out of the three, just like Porthos from the Three Musketeers, who doesn't seem to be in a very precarious position, who doesn't seem to have that much drama. Magna Kidmon isn't in a position where it might have to pick a side, as Bill Starmon and Gundramon could. The only and craziest thing it has done is defeat an enemy which ended up changing to become Avenge Kidmon, a Digimon who was created with the purpose of revenge, but because of its fury, it even forgot about taking revenge on Magna Kidmon. So what I can imagine is a sort of meeting between Bill Starmon and Magna Kidmon, where Magna Kidmon would address its friend with the nickname Bilko, and Bill Starmon might maybe not even react the way it used to. And uh, with Gundramon having basically changed allegiance and becoming part of the crack team with its brethren, is the team ever going to reconcile? Will they get together and form a strong bond again? Or will they all take their separate way? Or worse, will they end up fighting each other? I will leave you all with your ideas and thoughts. Please write them down in the comment section and write as much as you can about Digimon's Three Musketeers. They are quite unknown as a group, but they are extremely interesting and their potential for a story is crazy. Hey guys, in this quick break I want to tell you the following. Too bad not much has been written about the Three Musketeers, and quite frankly, I had to stretch out every bit of written sources about them and even go beyond to come with what you have just seen. I think it worked out quite well. What I'm going to do now, for those who haven't seen the videos yet, is show you here one by one the explaining videos about Magna Kidmon, Bill Starmon and Gundramon. That way you'd get to know more about the inspirations behind the characters and what they can do. And at least at the end of the video you'll get a complete view on the Three Musketeers and on the three characters who make the Three Musketeers. So grab your popcorn because as I said it is a special video. Let me introduce you to a very sad story, the story of a young man named Henry McCarthy, a story which shows the importance of parenthood. Henry McCarthy was a child born to parents of Irish Catholic ancestry in New York City sometime in 1859, and at a very young age he already lost his father, pushing him, his mother and his brother to move from place to place. His mother would meet a man named William Henry Harrison Antrim, with whom she would get married, and they would all be living together. And that is also how McCarthy got the name of Antrim. Shortly before McCarthy's mother would die of tuberculosis, the husband would abandon all of them, essentially making McCarthy and his brother orphans. And he was either only 14 or 15. With no parents to take care of him, he had no choice but to take care of himself. His instincts were to resort to crime when the occasion emerges. He lived for a while in a boarding house where he would be given room and board in exchange for work. He was however caught stealing food and a few days later he robbed a Chinese laundry stealing clothing and two pistols. He was charged with theft and was jailed but escaped two days later and became a fugitive. At some point McCarthy did track his stepfather and they temporarily lived together. However he was thrown out and that was the last time they saw each other. McCarthy did steal clothing and guns from him too. After leaving his stepfather he worked as a ranch hand in Arizona territory. He gambled his wages in nearby gaming houses and got acquainted with John R. Mackey, a Scottish-born criminal. The two men soon began stealing horses from local soldiers, earning McCarthy the nickname Kid Antrim. He got the name because of his youth, slight build, clean-shaven appearance and personality. At some point in 1877, McCarthy was at a saloon when he got into an argument with a blacksmith who reportedly had bullied him on more than one occasion. The fight that ensued ended with the blacksmith being shot and mortally wounded. The blacksmith died the following day and McCarthy was apprehended a few days later. He, again, 
managed to escape tension before law enforcement could arrive. McCarthy became well known when he took part in the Lincoln County War of 1878. For that, I will have to give you more context. The Lincoln County War was a five day long firefight between two factions. At the one side, you had the side of the businessman and store owner Lawrence Murphy. He and his partners dominated the town and county of Lincoln, New Mexico. They ran the main store called The House. And through their political connections, they controlled the forces of law and order and made money by being the sole traders in the area. On the other hand, you had the group standing behind an Englishman named John Turnstall, who arrived in Lincoln and set up a rival business with friends. Turnstall had the support of the smaller ranchers and farmers in the county, many of them Mexican-Americans. And Turnstall hoped to displace the main store which was called The House and create his own business empire in Lincoln County. That is why he hired a number of tough cowboys to run his ranch and McCarthy was among those cowboys. A sort of gun for hire. Flash forward, a war was sparked by the murder of Turnstall by a house gunman on February 18, 1878. Turnstall's cowboys, calling themselves the Regulators, set out to avenge him, and McCarthy played a key part in this. Killings and counter-killings continued throughout Lincoln County with law officers involved on both sides. It culminated in a five-day battle in the town of Lincoln itself, which ended in the burning down of Turnstall's store, many deaths and the triumph of the house gunman. McCarthy had sworn to kill everyone responsible for the death of Turnstall, of whom he had seemed to be very uncharacteristically fond of, perhaps even seeing him as a sort of father figure. So McCarthy and his gang killed a law enforcement officer, Sheriff Brady, and his deputy. And more than 30 people were killed in this conflict known as the Lincoln County War, and McCarthy went on the run. And you know what? The house still continued to dominate and influence the political and economic life of the area. Lawrence Murphy was eventually charged with the murder of Turnstall, but was acquitted, showing the power big businessmen like him had. Flash forward, after receiving several bounties on his head for capture, McCarthy got arrested and later killed two people while escaping from Lincoln County Jail. So a price was put on his head in 1881 and he was killed by a sheriff called Pat Garrett, who believed the justice system was too weak to deal with him. McCarthy was only 21 years old when he died. And during the final years of his life, newspaper reporters and dime novelists, who often embellished stories about the young outlaw, started referring to him as Billy the Kid. Billy the Kid's stories can be found everywhere, books, movies, and also in the internet. And his data was digitalized, and that gave birth to the Digimon Magna Kidmon, a Dragon Man Digimon. When we say dragon, that means that it must have some data similar to that of Dracomon, said to be the progenitor of all Dramon type Digimon. And that data developed differently to create the Dragon Man type and multiple other, which reminds me, we did go in depth to explain all Dragon type Digimon known to exist. Make sure to check it out if you haven't already. The link towards it is in the description box. And you will see that all of these Dragon type have their own looks, but tend to have something physically that will remind the viewer that they have a dragon ancestry somewhere. And in the case of Magna Kidmon, that would probably be the wings it has, with which it can soar high into the sky. Magna Kidmon got separated from its team for rather unknown reasons, and it's hard to imagine what might have separated them. Was it a conflict? Certain circumstances? We don't know. What we do know, however, is that it became a wanderer, traveling across the digital world in search of its comrades. And in a way, it reminds me of Billy the Kid who was also traveling a lot, going from one place to the other. While doing so, as the troublemaker Magna Kidmon is, it causes trouble and gets tangled up in scandal wherever it goes. It even defeated a Digimon that now gained a new form in search for revenge, I'll explain that in a moment. Although Magna Kidmon has a self-centered personality and is often indifferent of its surroundings, it is passionate about things like friendship or gratitude which explains why it is looking for its friends and why it also gained a new ally along the way. Deputymon, a mutant Digimon whose body got mutated and became a gun barrel. What's interesting about Deputymon and what could explain its connection with Magna Kidmon is that it is a somewhat lost and mysterious Digimon. <laughs> Doesn't really make sense what I'm saying here, eh? <laughs> so let me explain. See, the details of how Deputymon was born are completely unclear. That is why it is also hard to figure out how it looks 
genetically speaking. While it has a deep sense of justice, it only acts as a virus buster, whose members are usually holy or sacred Digimon. So, on the one hand, it has a deep sense of justice and acts like a virus buster, but at the other hand, it loves things like gamble and really loves the Russian roulette game. For those who do not know, the Russian roulette game is a potentially lethal game of chance in which a player places a single round in a revolver, spins the cylinder, places the muzzle against the head or body of the opponent or themselves and pulls the trigger. If the loaded chamber aligns with the barrel, the weapon will fire, killing or severely injuring the player. And so Deputy Mon loves playing that game and can overlook even a virus Digimon, who tend to be the arch nemesis of virus busters Digimon, if it can get through Russian Roulette. And after the game, Deputy Mon will be unable to hate them for a little while. Probably due to its nature and the fact that Deputy Mon is a bit of a gun itself, Magda Kidmon misinterprets the local Deputy Mon it came across as a member of its own species and became friends with them. I'm wondering if Magda Kidmon is aware that Deputy Mon has its own rival that may be lurking in the shadow. I'm talking about Ninja Mon, another mutant Digimon, and also a wanderer across the digital world. Now, back to Magna Kidmon. You see, Magna Kidmon is powerful and has many known and even unknown tools for combat. It can stab the opponent with the tiny machine guns connected to the magazines extended from its hips, immediately destroying the enemy's body from within. It can fly sky high, then aim at the opponent and fire live ammunition and plasma shots from the gun muzzles on its legs and the fingers of its hands, which pound away like falling rain. And it can invoke something called the Chaos Triangular. From the name, I assume it is magic. We don't know its properties, all we know is that it can be invoked when special conditions are met and we have no idea what it can do. As Magda Kinmon loves single combat, it is so severely trigger happy that it fires off bullets indiscriminately once it wins or loses. And this shows that Magda Kidmon, despite having a friendly aspect to it, it sure has a sort of crazy and rather unpredictable little side to it. Firing bullets indiscriminately, quite dangerous even for allies. I said previously that Magna Kidmon defeated the Digimon who was out there to get his revenge, right? Let me give you more information about it. Let me introduce you to the Digimon Avenge Kidmon. Visibly, it looks like a darker variant of Magna Kidmon, but its story is far from being the same and will give us some very interesting information about the possibilities in the digital world. Avenge Kidmon is the physical form of the desire for revenge of a Digimon defeated by Magna Kidmon. We don't know which Digimon got defeated by it. All we know is that its Digicore sort of malfunctioned once defeated. Now for your information, the Digicore is a type of nucleus and a powerful energy source that houses a Digimon's primary data and is analogous to its soul. If a Digimon loses its Digicore, the Digimon will immediately cease function. There is so much that can happen with a Digicore. Two Digimon can fuse, which means the Digicore will become one, creating a new being. A Digicore can also be altered. Some Digimon have multiple Digicores, etc. I can go on and on about it. It deserves its own video. Now, the Digimon who got defeated by Magna Kidmon had a very interesting process going on in its Digicore. As a result of what is called the Minus Mind Data applying an overload to the defeated Digimon's Digicore, the form of the defeated Digimon underwent a mutation-like transformation. Its form became similar to that of the one who defeated it, meaning Magna Kidmon. And now, in order to vent its raging fury at its form, becoming so similar to that of Magna Kidmon, it has forgotten even the goal of defeating Magna Kidmon. Weird, isn't it? It continuously sabotages its own goal and even have gone wild in some way, up to a point where it can even injure itself. For example, when it fights, it can sometimes stomp on the opponent without balking at injuring itself. It just want to get up close to fire an explosion inducing bullet at point blank range from the gun muzzles on its legs. It is also a somewhat trigger happy character as it hits the target with many energy shots from its finger causing them to hover in the air from the force. Then it fires live ammunition from its whole body and drives it into the opponent. So Avenge Kidmon is a Digimon that has a bit gone wild. And the truth is that Magna Kidmon may not even know of its existence. So I'd be very curious to see how both would interact with one another. You see, 
Machine Digimon, like let us say Andromon. Oh no, 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 like Machine Dramon. I think this example is more suitable. Machine Digimon tend to have been manufactured somewhere and by someone. We have discussed Machine Dramon's history and reason for existence in a separate video, which I will link you to it, so I will not get into the details here. Gundramon, on the other hand, has no information on the possible manufacturer. We don't know if it has a will of its own, like Machine Dramon. To add even more to it, we know that Machine Dramon was given a program containing evil intentions within its Digicore. We do not know much about Gundramon, there is no information about its Digicore or its intentions. The name Gundramon is a combination of Gun, which it has plenty of, we'll speak about the numbers in a moment, and Dramon. When a Digimon carries the Dramon name, it means that they are in a way or another offsprings of Dragomon, the progenitor of all Dragonesque type Digimon. I say offsprings because it is Dracomon's data that was spread around, and it either evolved, in some cases it mutated, in other cases it probably got experimented on, there is lots that happened to that data, giving the digital world a whole pantheon of different dragon type Digimon, which we have explained entirely in a separate video, if you haven't seen it, make sure to check it out, the link is in the description box. So Gundramon has dragon data in it, just like its partner Magna Kidmon, who is of the dragon man type. And maybe for your information, Dragon Man type of Digimon, like War Greymon for example and Magna Kidmon, are dragon descendants who look more humanoid than anything else. So the dragon traits are going to be less visible probably. Gundramon on the other hand is a dragon without a doubt. A large dragon Digimon with a body made entirely in metal and with a massive quantity of firearms. Its firepower is beyond outstanding. I tried to figure out how many guns it carries and someone named the bio-vending machine gave us his or her answer to the question, and these are the results. Gundramon has at least 21 visible guns, 3 guns on its head, 2 guns instead of hands, 2 shoulder mounted guns, at a minimum 2 guns on the bottom of its feet, probably used for propulsion, it has 2 guns on each of its heels, 2 guns on each of its knees, 2 giant guns mounted to its back like turrets, 2 guns on the top of its feet, its mouth is probably a giant gun or cannon when opened, its tail is also a gun, its wings are also made from guns, for giant guns to be precise. So it can't be more gun than that. This design to me is so overboard that I have no choice but to give it a solid and absolute 10 out of 10. This is nuts and we are not even done speaking about its properties. There's a reason why I used Machine Dramon as an example for comparison. It's because Machine Dramon and Gun Dramon are also on a same team called the Crack Team, a covered group of crackers from the human world who have some dangerous motives, one of which is the use of bacteriological weapons. We'll look at it in details in another video. But suffice it to say that the Crack Team loves to work with Cyborg Digimon because they are suitable for remodeling. It is confirmed that Gun Dramon occupies a similar spot to that of Machine Dramon. They are both positioned for use in combat. And that is of no surprise, both their bodies are 100% full metal. It may not be made out of chrome digizoid, the strongest metal in the Digimon universe, but metal remains metal, it is very durable. On top of that, Machine Dramon has power that can overwhelm other Digimon, especially when it fires its Super Dreadnought class energy waves from its two cannons. Gundramon is said to be faster than Machine Dramon and has high maneuverability such that it instantly moves within firing range. And its body is also made 100% of full metal, which by the way smells like the burning smell of cartridges. I'm going to assume that Gundramon should be about the same height as Machine Dramon, and Machine Dramon's height does vary depending on the media depiction, but it is a huge Digimon already. The smallest Machine Dramon came at 40 feet or 12 meters more or less, which is already big. The biggest Machine Dramon comes at 260 feet or 79.25 meters, that is an entire building already. Being this big, I can hardly imagine how big its blasts are going to be. It sort of reminds me of Baby Vegeta's technique in Dragon Ball Fighter Z. The Golden Great Ape is 32 feet tall or 9 meters, so all Machine Dramon depictions were much bigger. Can you imagine how crazy that is? So if Gundramon is going to be about the same height as Machine Dramon, then to be honest, it's a bit hard to imagine who could even defeat this Digimon. Well, Unless we are talking about War Greymon who carries the Dramon Destroyers, weapons designed to kill dragons while simultaneously also potentially being lethal towards War Greymon itself for also being a dragon descendant. 
Aside of that, I really failed to assess how Digimon of the likes of Gunjaman can be defeated, and it is a fast Digimon also, it can get in range relatively quick. In fact, one of its techniques is to pin the enemy to the ground with its feet and shoot them at point blank range. On top of that, with the multiple weapons it carries, it can fire a volley in all directions and can also be very precise when aiming. It can pick off the enemy's vitals. You can't really find a weak spot because its weapons can be fired in all directions. You know what, who might even store the most weapons? Is it Mega Gargumon, said to be a walking arsenal, or Gunjamon? Hmm. If you have an answer, share it in the comment section. I'm not going to tell you who the better and more destructive machine is between Gunjamon and its colleague Machine Jamon, even if I would love to see a death battle between the two. It would be highly destructive. What I do want to say though is that having both of them in one team should give the, well, the crack team a severe advantage. You know what? I'm going to ask you guys to be so generous and tell me who you think would be the better machine. Be open in your answer and consider all aspects, firepower, mobility, options, etc. In 1948, there is a woman who was born in America. Her name was Myra Maybell Shirley, although she was mostly called May. A sweet girl who received classical education and learned the piano while graduating from Missouri's Carthage Female Academy a private institution that her father had helped to found. While she may have looked rather ordinary by many, few were able to predict her rather exciting future. When we go into her future, we must take a look at what she did in the years 1861 till 1865, more known as the American Civil War. You see, May had a brother nicknamed Bud, who was six years older than her. He was active among the irregular forces known as bushwalkers, guerrilla bands organized to resist the federal troops who had been sent to compel Missouri, which is May's birthplace, to join the war against the Confederacy, which are unrecognized breakaway Confederate republics in the southern United States, and they are founded on the principle of white supremacy and that slavery coincided with the Bible's teachings. Now it is said that May was reputed to have supported her brother in these efforts, perhaps as a spy, but without any evidence. And when her brother was killed by federal troops, she and the rest of her family moved to Texas, where she would marry a man named Reed. After a bank robbery in Missouri in 1866, and have her first child named Rosie Lee, nicknamed Pearl. It is there that May gained the habit to ride side saddle while dressed in a black velvet riding habit and a plumbed hat carrying two pistols with cartridge belts across her hips. Now, her husband turned to crime and was even wanted for murder in Arkansas, which caused the family to move again, but this time to California, where they would get their second child named James Edwin. Now, May's husband continued his path of crime by being involved with several criminal gangs, even joining the Star Clan, a Cherokee Indian family notorious for whiskey, cattle, and horse thievery in the Indian Territory, now known as Oklahoma. And for your record, Indian in this context means indigenous. Unfortunately, Reed, May's husband, was killed that year due to his activities. In 1880, she married a Cherokee man named Sam Starr and settled with the Starr family, giving her the Starr family name. With them, she learned ways of organizing, planning and fencing for the rustlers, horse thieves and bootleggers, as well as harboring them from the law and her illegal enterprises proved lucrative enough for her to employ bribery to free her colleagues from the law whenever they were caught. Her life as an outlaw queen abruptly ended with her husband's death when he was involved in a gunfight with his own cousin who was a law officer. Both men were killed. And flash forward, two days before her 41st birthday, May Star was killed. She was riding home from a neighbor's house when she was ambushed. After she fell off her horse, she was shot again to make sure she was dead. And her death resulted from shotgun wounds to the back and neck and in the shoulder and face. And there are only rumors, but the case is actually still unresolved. The outlaw queen died and reached the legends. Though the legends would mostly remember her as the notorious Bell Star. Beelzebub, in demonology, is known as one of the seven deadly demons or seven princes of hell and represents the sin of gluttony and envy. And according to the Dictionnaire Infernal, which is a book on demonology describing demons organized in hierarchies, 
Bill's Bob is a being capable of flying, earning it the nickname Lord of the Flyers, or Lord of the Flies, if you please. According to the Testament of King Solomon, Beelzebub is a prince of demons that was formerly a leading heavenly angel, a fallen angel in other words. What is so unique about Beelzebub is that his name has been used not only to accuse one of being possessed by demons, but it is also used as an insult and an attempt to categorize unexplained behavior such as schizophrenia. In other words, just the name Beelzebub reached a point where, upon hearing it, many would associate the name with something bad and evil. And many people died innocently just by simply being indirectly associated to the name. Think of the Salem witch trials, a series of hearings and prosecutions of people accused of witchcraft which would end in one's execution. Miss Bell Starr's story and Bill's Bob story may seem completely out of the blue and completely unrelated, but they are not. You see, Bell Star may be dead, and Bill's Bob may exist or, well, may not, but their information can be found not just in books but also online on the internet. In other words, they have become data. That data got combined and was digitalized to give birth to Bill Starmon, a Digimon categorized as a demon man, and its name says it all. On one hand, it got created by the data of Bellstar, the outlaw queen, and the references can be seen throughout. Bill Starmon splendidly manipulates twin pistols called Rizoma de Loto, which means Lotus Root. These weapons are like the little sisters to the Berenjena possessed by Billsmon. These are weapons forged by the Digimon god of smithery, Vulcanismon, which is making me wonder whether Bill Starmon's weapons were also forged by this god. After all, the weapons do work the same, they are usually aimed at someone's vitals. A notable difference though is that Beelzmon's Berenjena are shotguns with bullets that didn't get a name. Beel Starmon's Rizomo de Loto are twin pistols with bullets called Fly Bullet, with Fly being without a doubt a reference to Beelzebub, the Lord of Flies. Now it isn't a coincidence that Beelzmon is being referred to in this video, because Beel Starmon is also called the Beelzmon Lady. They both do resemble each other design-wise, and both have roots leading them to the demon Beelzebub. However, despite looking the same, and I'm sure that many would see them ending up together because of the similarities, they actually both are in a state of quarrelsome disagreement. You see, Beel Starmon opens up to everybody without hesitation, and in particular it is close friends with many gun-wielding Digimon like Magna Kidmon, for example, who even gave Bill Starmon the nickname Bilko. However, she doesn't agree with Billsmon's solitary existence, so although Bill Starmon recognizes the competence of Billsmon, it does prefer to keep a slight distance. Bill Starmon's personality is quite interesting. You see, it may have been a construction of the outlaw queen, Bell Star, and the demon Billsbob, and still there is a certain kindness to it, which almost seem out of character. In the continuity of Digimon Cross Wars, there is a place called Sand Zone, a massive desert area littered with pyramids and ancient ruins. It was once home to a thriving civilization and was once the heart of a prosperous city named Silicalia or Sandoria, a city protected by the warriors of light. And the following was said about these warriors, and I quote, Chosen by their queen for the courage and justice in their hearts, they stabilized the Sand Zone even in the midst of war and upheaval. By raising their hands to a statue of their queen, they glow with her light. That queen, or goddess, depending on the depiction, that used to protect the city of Sandoria does bear a certain physical resemblance to Beel Starmon, although it looks to be in a sort of priest mode like Magna Angemon. And this does remind me of one thing. I said previously that Beelzebub, according to the testament of King Solomon, was once a leading heavenly angel, right? Until he wasn't and became a demon. Could this be a sign that Bill Starmon was once an angel? What do you think of it? Let us know in the comment section. There is data of another relatively known character that was also included in the creation of Bill Starmon, but some might have looked over it. You see, in the universe created by video game and entertainment company Sega, there is a character by the name of Bayonetta, real name Ceriza, a mysterious Umbra witch a clan of European dark arts practitioners from ancient times and the darker counterpart of the Illumin Sages. Their discipline was quite varied, 
breathing, movement, medicine and tactics were joined in the Middle Ages by training in the operation of heavy weapons. Ceresa was sealed away during the witch hunts until she was found and awakened 500 years later, spending 20 years with amnesia. She forgot a lot, but sure didn't forget how to use magic on her hairs to make that skin-tight bodysuit she's wearing. And she is also very creative with her set of four large caliber handguns. She's holding two of the four guns in her hands and the other two are attached at her ankles. Let me give you some brief history about the gun and a quote. Crafted by the famed demon smith Rodin, these four guns have been crowned with the names Parsley, Sage, Rosemary and Dime, pushing Bayonetta's magic to its limits. These guns rate of fire and stopping power are incredible. Just like Bayonetta, Beale Starmon is also wearing a jet black leather suit and has quite frankly even a similar curvy body. And they both also tend to have a habit to show naked parts of their bodies. Also, Beale Starmon is wearing a muffler that is able to transform according to use such as for offense and defense or even wings. Quite similar to Bayonetta who can also make pretty much everything it imagines. The finishing touch would be Beale Starmon wildly firing the guns hidden in the heels of its boots. It can do that in quite a similar fashion as Bayonetta. It is quite impressive to see how much inspiration was used to create BL Starmon and also all other Digimon. This is why I've always said that the Digimon universe in terms of inspiration is crazy. And right here in Digimon Explained we are going to keep digging and unveil as much as we can which, as far as I can tell, could be endless. Hey guys, this is the end of the video, I hope you enjoyed it. Like so, we have finally discussed one Digimon team fully, and I have tried to be as detailed as possible. I love the work, and again, the three Musketeers individually already have a lot of potential for storytelling, let alone as a team. But the three Musketeers are probably the Digimon team with the least development and attention given by the developers, which is a shame. They are all very unique and they are one of the few Digimon team who might look good natured but have been associated with groups or Digimon who are outright bad. So the potential for a sort of dramatic story where everyone will be captivated is more certainly there. I hope that the Digimon developers will find inspiration from you guys because I want you to write as much as you can in the comment section about the three Musketeers as a group and as individuals. If you have managed to come this far in the video, I hope you wouldn't mind to follow me on Instagram and need some backup on that platform as well for other plans. Make sure to like the video to help the channel fight the YouTube algorithm and please subscribe to the channel for more Digimon lore. I feel very hyped at this very moment in my life and that also explains why I managed to make so many Digimon videos in just one week. So I'd like to get through as many Digimon as I can while also taking into account the Apmon. Don't think I've forgotten about them. In case you guys are new, know that all Digimon videos are placed in different Digimon playlists, which are always updated. That way you can catch up on newer and older videos.